I am here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, part of NASA, the place where almost all the planetary exploration missions are being done. Today we are talking of a very special kind of a robot, a robot which looks like a snake. And I have with me Rohan Thakkar. He's a technologist who works on robots and has made a special robot which looks like a snake, still in development, but very promising. Uh, Rohan has studied at Nagpur and that makes him very special for India and for our audience. Uh, Rohan, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, the project you are working on. Thank you. Uh, so basically, if you look at the way we explore uh, space and our solar system right now, in most missions we start with the orbiter, lander, small rover and then large rover, right? Uh, and the reason why we go with this workflow is because it allows us to get as much information as possible about the terrain beforehand. So what we are trying to do in EELS is create a versatile system both from a hardware perspective as well as intelligence and software perspective. So when you combine these versatile hardware and software, what you can get is the ability to explore unknown terrains where imagine, you know, exploring things like uh, craters on the moon, maybe lava tubes on Mars or something as far away as the moons of Jupiter and Saturn where they have discovered giant oceans, right? It would take us years to get there, right? Uh, so what we are really trying to do is build the technology so that you have one system that can operate in different mobility modes uh, and has the versatility like biological systems like real snakes. Now, what advantage does it give you to have it uh, look like a snake or a python uh, and, and when it slithers and gets in? Right. So the main advantage is that, uh, you know, in space there are no roads, right? There are no stop signs or even like speed limits, right? Uh, so what, what you really need is a platform that can go over like harsh terrains. So think about like, you know, rubble, steep slopes, maybe sand, uh, there could be ice, there could be like swimming underwater, uh, maybe like navigating on an asteroid. Uh, and we wanted to build like one platform that can do all these things and that's where you know uh, having something like a snake would give you an advantage over something that has wheels or rovers. So wheels and rovers have been done. Uh, I don't think snakes have been tried. Even on earth I have not seen uh, uh, robots which are look like snakes. We are very familiar with snakes in India. I, I have them in my backyard, but, but we don't see robotic snakes. Yes. So, uh, I do want to emphasize that research on robotic snakes has been going around uh, since, you know, 1980s or 1990s. But there is a reason why you don't see these robots, you know, everywhere, right? Because the technology is still not completely matured. And in our project, we are trying to change that. Uh, and uh, to, to give you a few, you know, analogs of why you, what, what makes this problem challenging is uh, especially the intelligence part, which is what my team works on, uh, where even if you think about trying to control a snake robot, right? The robot has more than, you know, 30 motors on it. So think of it like controlling like a self-driving car with more than 30 steering wheels and 30 pedals uh, in an environment where there are no roads, stop signs or speed limits. Uh, that's, that's really the intelligence problem that we need to solve. No. Do you think it will be helpful for a project like Artemis because at some point they would need uh, uh, putting up human habitation on the moon and, and they were looking at tubes and caves uh, which need to be explored. So there is probably an immediate need for your work. Yeah, so about the, you know, immediate future of the project, that's, that's really, you know, uh, 
not i i can't speak directly to that but i can at least say from a technology sp- standpoint uh, there are certain use cases that could show up in many missions including artemis that we are working on one of the most natural ways to you know think about this robot is uh, it's it's like a mobile manipulator it's a robotic arm that is also a vehicle right and uh, that can have many applications including like you know something as near as artemis but uh, immediate use case uh, is is not really identified uh, what we are trying to do is show people by demonstrating the first of all developing the technology and then demonstrating it on earth uh to show that you know the technology is mature enough so that it can be picked up by you know near term missions sure and, and why is it called a robot linked to exobiology and can you can you expand eels for me yes uh so eel stands for exobiology extant life surveyor uh you can imagine uh, the most common question i get is did the acronym come first or did the you know full form come first it was a bit of both uh but the idea was again like tying it back to you you know these like distant you know places of our solar system that are unexplored so far um uh, you know it's places where like wheel robots like may not be able to traverse uh and where you want the versatility and there's a lot of uncertainty in the case where you don't really know what's out there so imagine if you had like you know uh uh no idea about what you might see once you get over there and you still want to like do science then i see uh this robot as like a jack of all trades where if you knew the terrain beforehand you can optimize one robot that will work for that terrain really well with very low power but if you don't know the terrain this robot is kind of like your ultimate scout which can you know you can just have it on the payload and then it will figure out it's the jack of all trades now when we talk of exobiology uh, do you think uh, it is targeting and you are taking the frontiers to the next step which is to look for extraterrestrial life and that is your big goal uh i would say that's ultimately you know uh the aspiration of nasa to answer the question like if we are alone how did our solar system start so everything that we do in terms of our uh you know uh technology development there is a whole thing called science traceability matrix so whenever we you know try to develop a new technology feature uh we work very closely with scientists and try to ask themselves okay how does my technology trace to a particular like science objective uh so as we as the technology gets mature and we start asking ourselves uh you know how do we use this for a immediate mission those are the kind of questions that we'll be asking ourselves okay we have this technology what is the science instrument that we can add to the head or the tail of the robot to answer these fundamental questions a younger bob balram in yourself yes i think you know uh, bob has been like you know very uh, inspirational to me and i kind of had a very similar aspiration where uh, you know i want to work on technologies which kind of uh, uh, enable these missions which people don't even think are possible and it takes a lot of patience uh, dedication um uh, and you know uh, hard work to actually kind of make it work because you have to go through all these like failures and field tests that we constantly keep on doing uh and then one day you know the technology becomes mature and then it finally goes to flight sure now where have you tested this uh, eels robot yes so eels uh, has been tested at multiple places uh we started testing locally uh once the robot was assembled we took it to the mars yard which is at jpl where we basically like recreated uh, mars to simulate the rocks the sand uh the the terrain to make it look as close as possible to mars uh so we started testing over there uh we've also taken it to uh nearby locations there's a table mountain facility up uh, back in those mountains uh and there is snow over there in december so we tested it on snow as well as hard ice uh 
uh, and recently we also went to the Athabasca Glacier which is in the Canadian Rockies to, because one of the cool things about uh, snakes is it can also go down holes right so there are a lot of like moulins and crevasses where you can perform like vertical mobility uh, in addition to all these like surface mobility use cases uh, so we've also tested it at the Athabasca Glacier there could be many uses on earth why are you waiting just for to do it on other planets or other planetary bodies I'm sure there would be many places where firefighters, maybe uh, for reconnaissance, they would want a robot like this up and running and there could be much more money coming your way to do your development. Absolutely. I'm glad you asked that question. And uh, that is basically what our you know, immediate uh, focus might turn out to be. Uh, but basically, uh, one of the things that you know I'm really proud of is... Uh, all the work that we do is open, so we have around like 8 to 10 research papers that we are publishing on the results that we have from, uh, you know, all the tests that I've described and it's all open and our hope is to advance the technology so that uh, it not only impacts, you know, space exploration use cases, but also earth applications like, you know, disaster rescue and earthquakes, uh, search and rescue and many other, you know, mission scenarios. Correct. You studied in Nagpur in India and tell me a little bit about your uh, schooling and your college and, 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 and did the idea of having a snake-like robot germinate, uh, say, in India where we, where, where we live closely with snakes and snakes are worshipped in such a big way? Right. Uh, so I'll also take this opportunity to, you know, talk to all the, you know, uh, young engineers that might be budding in India. Uh, so I can describe how I got into like robotics as well. So uh, I wasn't a star student in my school. Uh, I actually got pretty bad grades when like I was in eighth grade. Uh, and then suddenly, you know, when I was studying in 10th, I got really excited about physics and science and math. Uh, and uh, when I was in 11th and 12th, I was trying to prepare for IIT and uh, I, I got into NIT Nagpur, not into IIT. Uh, and then I was forced to pick like one major, like, you know, electrical, karna hai, mechanical, karna hai, computer science. Karna hai, and I was like, I want to do all these things. <laughs> uh, and uh, I ended up taking mechanical, but that heart was, you know, I want to understand everything. And then robotics is uh, something that allowed me to explore all these domains, uh, but still have some specialization. And I was also fascinated with uh, artificial intelligence from a sci-fi perspective, where you know all the things that this technology could enable to make human life better. And uh, at that time, my parents were like, you know, isme scope kya hai, job kaise milega? And I was like, I don't care. I really enjoy doing this work and I want to do it and I became so good that I actually got an internship at IIT Bombay with uh, Professor Amarnath where uh, I, I did a small summer project on building like a small snake robot uh, for research that used to wiggle around in our lab. So it's, uh, you know, very interesting to see. I used to ask myself, okay, what are the applications where I can use this? And then when we got to JPL... Uh, How did you get to JPL? Yes. So my path to JPL was once I graduated from uh, uh, NIT Nagpur, I worked at Bangalore at a startup called Systemantix that builds robotic arms. Uh, I did that for a year and I then I got into uh, Carnegie Mellon University for grad school. Uh, so uh, I, I did a lot of, that's where I got into autonomy. My undergrad was in mechanical engineering. And then after CMU, I got a job directly through the career fair at uh, JPL. Now, India recently did a robotic landing on the moon surface with uh, Vikram Lander and Chandrayaan-3. Uh, you, uh, you are also a person who does robotics and that was also autonomous, partly artificial intelligence, whichever you, you look at it. As somebody who hails from India, what was your feeling when... Uh, Vikram soft landed and soft landed nearer the south pole of the moon, which is where I say there is a gold rush. Everybody wants to go nearer the south pole. Yes. 
So for me it was really like watching a cricket match and you know we were looking at it on the TV and you were like yeah we did it we did it and that's that's really like how uh, you know proud I am to see like uh, India make all these achievements and at the end of the day you know like you like we discussed earlier our goal is to understand the solar system so uh, it's it's basically like if you look at uh, you know our own team at JPL we have people from India we have people from Japan we have people from Europe so it's a pretty like internationally diverse team and uh, that is something that I'm really proud of that we all all the work that we are doing is published in research papers and it's all about like advancing science by working with the best minds all over the world together. So, how soon do we see an eel uh, fully deployed and likely to fly on a mission? I'm asking a very futuristic question, I understand. Uh, I, I can't put like an exact timeline on it, uh, but you know, I would at least hope that it's within my lifetime. That's the amount of patience I have. Uh, and that's basically how research goes, right? You know, it could be in five years, but it could also take a lifetime. So it's very uncertain. Uh, and the progress is like very non-linear. So sometimes, you know, uh, it takes, it might take you like uh, one year to get like 90% of the performance, but it might take you one decade to go from 90 to 99. And no one knows, you know, what our curve is going to look like in terms of technology maturation. But, uh, you know, as uh, an engineer, as a researcher, uh, I, I have the patience to wait and keep pushing no matter how long it takes. Now, coming from, c coming from the heart of India and, and to the heart of the universe, as the JPL sign says, I wish you luck in getting your... Eels robot up and running and my own sincere feeling is you should probably get a use scenario on earth long before you have a use scenario on planets looking for life uh, thanks a lot so that was Rohan Tucker somebody who works on a robot which looks like a snake still under development looking for life using that robot is one big mission but there could be many use case scenarios on Earth. Looking for survivors of earthquakes could be one very important aspect which could be of immediate use in disaster relief. At the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of NASA in Pasadena, Palau Bagla for NDTV.